Distinguished guests, excellencies, dear students, dear colleagues from the Faculty of Social Sciences, it is a pleasure and honor to be able to welcome you here on the occasion of a dialogue with Commissioner Lenercic. The topic is the European Commission in a geopolitical storm functioning of European Union crisis mechanisms in practice. So, first of all, we will hear an address by our Dean, Dr. Istok Prezel, and the European Commission Representation Office, represented by Mrs. Yerneya Jukirše, and then we will have a dialogue with Mr. Linercic. So, Dean, the floor is yours. Your Excellency, Commissioner, Madam Yukirše of the European Commission Representation Office, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Faculty of Social Sciences. We are living at a time of exceptional geopolitical turmoil, and we are faced with some players who want to change the current relationships in our society and across the globe. They use excuses to show that for them only selective rules apply, rules that should apply instead to everybody. Crises have become something permanent on the national level and also on the international level. I am pleased that this dialogue is taking place at our faculty, where crisis and crisis management is studied, researched, and also taught. We also teach crisis management. Now, according to a definition, crisis is a situation where there is a risk and where there is a necessity to respond. And when there is a high degree of uncertainty, regardless of whether you take action or not, the situation is still uncertain. The only certain thing today is that crisis will come, but the uncertainties are when they will start, how, and where. It is clear that once crises start, they never play according to the scenario. All we can do is to prepare a plan that will more or less respond to the crisis that will be triggered, and this is a huge problem. Serious crises always appear where we are the most vulnerable and where we do not expect them. This would be the definition of a serious crisis. The key problem in Europe at the national and international level are several, speaking of crisis management, and I would like to mention just three of them for which we have still not managed to find a solution. The first one is that we are faced with a um, chain of various crises following each other. The second problem is that we have a synchronous crisis, crisis happening at the same time. Economic crisis happen in cycles. Migration crisis doesn't end. The climate crisis is getting more intense. The food crisis is also happening across the globe. Then we now have a military crisis we thought we were living in a bubble and we never expected a military crisis. The health crisis has finally, is finally coming to an end. And now we have to do something to organize our society the best we can. The question is, who can manage all of these crises? And the answer is all of us together, but how? The third issue is, an integrated and a comprehensive approach. The mantra seems to be that we all have to approach crises in a comprehensive way, but if we have a look at our attempts of managing crisis, we see that we are still far away from an ideal situation. So there are many challenges, and at our faculty, we are trying to prepare our student for this modern world. We try to help them to analyze the situation look for solutions and implement them. And the 9th of May is the day of peace, celebration of peace. Robert Schumann, in his declaration, 
expressed his view, Karl Deutsch also said that Europe should be an amalgamated, or at least a plural society. So today is an opportunity to contemplate the situation and to assess where we are, where we should be, what is going well and what is not going so well. In this sense, I am very pleased to be able to welcome Mr. Commissioner here at our faculty. I welcome this dialogue and I believe that you are at the right place to discuss these topics and I'm very much looking forward to a fruitful discussion. And now I will join the listeners and I'm all ears. Thank you very much. And now I would also like to give the floor to Dr. Yerneya Yukirše, who is the head of the European Commission Representation Office in Slovenia. Thank you very much, distinguished Dean, Professor Dr. Prezel, Professor Dr. Jelena Juvan, Professor Dr. Matthias Nachtigal, distinguished guests. It is a great honor for me today on the Europe Day to be able to welcome Mr. Janusz Lenarcic in our midst, the European Commissioner for Crisis Management, at a time where we are facing escalating geopolitical and climate conditions, crisis management mechanisms of the EU are even more important. And there are not too many people who know them better than Commissioner Lenarcic. As we all know, Russia attacked Ukraine contrary to all international law norms. The EU come to rescue to the attacked state and started the biggest civil protection operation until now. Commissioner Lenarcic had and still has a key role in the coordination and in providing the emergency aid. But it's not just the war, but it's also the climate change that are resulting in floods and fires in Europe. So we have to make sure that Europeans are safe and secure. And among the key tasks of both the European Commission and Mr. Commissioner Lenacic in particular is to encourage and support the solidarity among EU member states. How to further strengthen cooperation of EU member states in the field of civil protection in the context of a tough geopolitical and climate crisis? This will be the topic of our discussion. I'm sure it will be a very informative debate, and I would like to thank Commissioner Lenacic and all of you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yerneya Yukirše. And thank you, European Commission, the co organizer of this event. And now I would like to once again welcome Mr. Janis Linarcic. So, this dialogue will be moderated by Dr. Jeleno Juvan and myself, Matthias Nachtigal. I am the head of the Chair for International Relations. We will have three sessions. First of all, the context of operation of the European Commission with all challenges involved. In the second part, we will talk about the most suffering regions of Europe and the world. We will hear about his experience, possible solutions, and in the third part, we will also discuss the planned strengthening of the strategic autonomy of the EU in an ever more related and intertwined world. This debate will take about an hour, and then we will open the floor for discussion. You will all have an opportunity to ask questions, to exchange views, but this also goes for our guests. I know many of you are listening to this uh, debate online. You are all very much welcome. We will also uh, note all the questions you have, and we will submit them to 
Commissioner Linercic in the third session, and we should be finished by half past five. This is the plan, and now I suggest that we start with our questions. Today is a very important day and an opportunity to contemplate where the EU is today with all geostrategic turmoils that it is facing, but also with all the challenges uh, of inclusive development, um, green and digital transitions, and we are very pleased to have one of the most experienced diplomats that Slovenia has with us. Now, Mr. Lenercic has a plethora of tasks in some of the most uh, problematic areas. EU would like to be a force that contributes to a more humane and inclusive development, but working as part of a crisis mechanisms is one of the most demanding areas of the EU. How can the goals of the European Commission be achieved? We know that you also have many obligations across the world. How can you coordinate all of this? Well, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for the invitation. I am very happy to be able to participate in this debate. I know we have a limited time allotted, so I will proceed to answering your question. Now, first of all, about my portfolio. My title, European Commissioner for Crisis Management, is somewhat generic. Some people think that I have to interfere with every crisis, but I am in fact Commissioner for Crisis Management and my portfolio is civil protection and humanitarian aid. This defines the crisis that uh, pertain to my portfolio. When speaking about civil protection, we're talking about crises that affect people, human lives, then property, and I'm thinking not about loss of money in stock exchange, but rather damage to physical property, then we are talking about damage to our nature, to our heritage, and so on. So these are the crises that are covered by the civil protection. For example, a cyber attack as such does not belong to my portfolio. If, however, a cyber attack has a uh, spillover effect on the critical infrastructure that can pose a risk to human life or property, then our mechanisms is activated. The second part of my portfolio concerns humanitarian aid. And this part of my portfolio concerns areas beyond the EU. And I'm not saying that there are no humanitarian needs in the EU. We have millions of refugees from Ukraine. But the fact is that within the EU, we have a number of other, including financial uh, uh, tools to address such challenges. However, if we go outside the EU, humanitarian aid is the only tool we have to help. Now, so much about my portfolio. Now, about the legal basis. The main challenge with the European civil protection is the simple fact that in line with the Lisbon Treaty, civil protection is a national competence, a national responsibility. And when it comes to civil protection, the European Commission only plays a supporting role. In practical situations, this can be quite a challenge. Quite a challenge. And let me illustrate this by the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are talking about healthcare, and healthcare is also a competency of the member states. So, healthcare and civil protection, but at the same time, it was quite clear right from the onset of the pandemic that we need 
more Europe if we wanted to face the pandemic in an efficient way. And it turned out quite soon that national measures are not enough because as we kept emphasizing, the virus didn't know any national border. So despite this uh, division of responsibilities, there are challenges ahead of the EU as to how to achieve concerted action of member states in ever more frequent crisis. And here, I would like to relate to what the Dean said. He said that crises are here to stay. And if uh, this is true of something, it is true of our term of office in our European Commission. Well, we started our term of office with a number of crises, health crises, that resulted in several other crises. And then, after two years, when we started thinking that we are finally done with the crisis, the Moscow leadership decided to invade Ukraine, resulting in another global crisis, which required us to trigger our crisis mechanism. By the way, our operation that we are operating through our civil protection mechanism to support Ukraine is the most complex and the longest lasting oper civil protection operation ever. More than 90,000 tons of aid has been sent to Ukraine. And we are talking about all sorts of aid, food, medicine, medical equipment, ambulances, firefighting vehicles, uh, equipment to protect their national monuments, and so on and so forth. We also carry out medical evacuations of uh, Ukrainian patients and wounded persons. And so far, more than 2,000 persons have been evacuated. So it's the biggest operation ever, and it's continuing but this means that our crisis mechanisms that were set up in a different era are overloaded and have to carry a bigger load than ever before. At the same time, we are also noticing that um, natural disasters continue to accompany us. And not only that, their intensity and frequency are on the increase. Just remember floods in Germany and Belgium in 2021. Just remember fires in summer last year. And all these facts point to the fact that although civil protection is a national competency, there is an ever greater need to work in a coordinated manner in facing this crisis. In crisis management, the European Union must have a bigger role because the crises that I have just mentioned are not limited to any single country. And this is why they require a coordinated action. And to do so, the European Union is best placed to help out. I think this would be my first answer. Well, thank you very much. If we go back to the conceptual points of departure, very demanding institutional relationship, division of responsibilities within the EU, and then also relations with member states as envisaged by the Lisbon Treaty, and as you're trying to enforce them in practice, and the question is, where are European citizens? The Larkin Declaration has pointed out the need for a close cooperation between European institutions and European citizens so that citizens can better understand the connection between the goals of the EU and the daily operation of European institutions. And that concerns challenges like climate change, uh, 
combating social exclusion, sustainable development, solidarity, and so on. How can you strengthen the understanding and the support of European citizens, and how can you strengthen the transparency and the understanding of the division of responsibilities, and how is it possible to involve European citizens so that they will support the efforts of both the member states as well as the European institutions. EU citizens are the most important ally of crisis management at the EU level. They expect to be protected by Europe whenever a crisis situation occurs. And over the recent years, these expectations resulted in quite a huge development of crisis management at the EU level. I said at the very beginning that according to the treaty, civil protection is a national competence, meaning that um, member states are responsible for the preparedness as well as for the response. However, Already in the past, we have seen crises which exceeded the capacities of member states. And this is why, in 2001, regardless of the Lisbon Treaty, the European Civil Protection Mechanism has been established, establishing the so-called second level of crisis management in addition to the national level. The European Civil Protection Mechanism is based on mutual assistance, solidarity among member states or also in relation to any third country. Any country can address this mechanism and ask for help. And then we organized and coordinate assistance offered by the member states from their national capabilities. We provide for transportation, coordination, and we also co-finance the majority of costs for such operations. But this too has turned out to be insufficient due to ever more severe crisis. And in this sense, 2017 was the turning point with huge fires in Portugal. Portugal turned to the European Civil Protection Mechanism for assistance, and no member state came to the rescue. Why? Because all capabilities, in particular the firefighting planes, it was a late autumn fire, and all planes were already deactivated. They were in maintenance or similar. And the Portuguese population, the pop Portuguese citizens said, where is Europe when we need help? And at that point in time, we started to think about a third level of European crisis management. So in addition to mutual help, which is based on mutual solidarity among member states, another level, European capabilities, would also be established. And in this case, we are talking about planes that are used to put out fires. This capability has been established under the name of RESCU. So this is the third level, and this third level is managed by the European Commission. So these are European capabilities that are used as uh, a tool of last resort when the second level, the solidarity among member states, is insufficient. The importance of this third level was evident last summer, also in the case of Slovenia, where there was not enough response by member states and their national capabilities, we had to activate everything we had in the RESC EU, including uh, capabilities that were used in Slovenia. And due to our experience last summer, we will double our capabilities this summer. 
for the simple fact that we are noticing that there is an unstoppable increase and there is more and more need for additional capabilities. Now to go back to the European citizens, research has shown that the support by European citizens to this type of solidarity is extremely high, both when it comes to civil protection and the humanitarian aid. European citizens have constantly supported uh, our efforts. More than 90% of European citizens have constantly supported our efforts, and this has also helped us to set up more Europe in uh, these areas, which otherwise, like I said, are a national competence. And now I would like to invite Dr. Jelena Yuvan to help me out with her question. Well, welcome, Mr. Commissioner. I have a question which concerns decision-making. Last week, news was published that Slovenia joined a group of eight member states which want to change the decision-making process from um, anonymous to majority vote. We have seen many such initiatives in the past. Some wanted to also revise the Lisbon Treaty. But what do you uh, believe? What do you think about this initiative? Is this one of the ways to speed up the decision-making process because we have seen in Ukraine that the decision-making process can really be very time-consuming and lengthy. Well, personally, I am very pleased to see that Slovenia is uh, in the group of countries that are in favor of qualified majority voting when it comes to the foreign security policy. And this is for two reasons. Because Slovenia is in very good company, in the company of the founding pro-European members. And uh, we are not in the company of more or less problematic, because there are also some more problematic countries. But it's also a good initiative. And you said, Professor Yuvan, that when it comes to CFSP, it can be quite a long and time-consuming process. Luckily, I'm not directly affected due to the, deci the current decision-making, because when it comes to crisis management, both humanitarian aid and a civil protection, we have different proceedings which allow us to respond and take decisions very quickly. However, when it comes to crisis, like the current crisis in Sudan, where you need unanimity by member states, it can take quite some time. And you will remember, it also happened with Ukraine, and we are currently talking about the 11th package of sanctions. And on a regular basis, whenever sanctions were decided, there were issues with the same or with two or three countries. Of course, every country has its own interests, but if it takes unanimity, it can be quite a demanding operation, personally. I'm afraid that this initiative does not stand great chances of success in the short run. Because if you want to switch from decision taking by unanimity to decision making by qualified majority, well, it is possible according to the Lisbon Treaty. In any area, you can decide to switch from unanimity to qualified majority. However, it takes unanimity to take such a decision. And I'm afraid that those 
member states that uh, were the most troublesome when decided on uh, sanctions in the Ukraine case, I'm afraid that those countries are going to oppose and that it will be very difficult to achieve unanimity in the short run. This does not change the fact, however, that by joining this initiative, Slovenia has shown its progressive stance and a desire for more Europe, because this is something we need. The situation globally is changing. We have a geopolitical storm, and uh, to have lengthy discussions about what we're going to do during the storm can be very dangerous. Let's move on to Sudan. You mentioned it yourself. Now, Sudan is a good example how quickly the security situation can escalate. Africa and the Sahel countries in particular have been um, the goal of European efforts for several decades. We also have a very strong interest of certain member states, France in particular, and it seems that France is dictating the EU policy with regard to Sahel countries. And uh, it seems that the EU is only following France. What is good is that the EU has finally understood that it's not enough to just uh, stop an armed conflict, but that you also have to face the roots of the conflict. And they can be very complex. Also, spillover effects can be uh, uh, very powerful, so you need a comprehensive approach. I'm sure you know very well what uh, the EU is doing in Africa and in the Sahel region. What else can the EU do? We have new global players in the region strengthening their impact. For example, China or Russia through the Wagner Group, they have actually annulled all the efforts of the EU in Mali, for example. So how can the European Union maneuver its way in the current situation? We see that some older mechanisms are no longer effective. Well, thank you very much. It would take a lot of time to provide you with uh, a complex answer. First of all, Sudan. As you know, Sudan is the place of great strategy. And it's a great tragedy that has occurred there. That we have seen protests that lasted several months. And we have seen a ray of hope towards a democratic society. This process was ended. General al Buhan and al Hamati joined their forces. And Hamduk had to step down. In this way, the democratic process was stopped. And to complete the story, we have then seen a combat between the two generals as to who will take the power. And who is the victim? Civilians, of course. The 30-year dictatorship has caused quite a lot of distress for many citizens. And you will have heard about the situation in Darfur. You will also know the situation in the Nuba Mountains. And our uh, humanitarian worker, Tomo Krijner, has been very active there. What I'm trying to say is that even before the current conflict, there has been more than enough problems in Sudan. Before the outbreak of fight, 60 million of citizens in Sudan required humanitarian aid. That is about a third of the population. After the conflict, this number is going to grow steeply because currently there is no way to deliver humanitarian aid. There is no way to deliver health care, education. Uh, basic services are not provided for, such as water, electricity, 
and the violence itself is going to increase the demand for humanitarian aid. At the moment, they have hundreds of thousands of internally displaced and more than 100,000 people have fled the country. We are responding as quickly as we can. We have increased the humanitarian aid to our partners who are trying to continue to be active in Sudan. Of course, it cannot be done in all areas, in certain regions, nothing can be done, including the region of Darfur. But we are trying to take care of increased humanitarian demands where humanitarian aid is still possible. In particular, in neighboring countries like uh, the Chad, they're facing uh, a big increase in uh, refugees fleeing to their country from Sudan. Also, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, the Chad Lake, there you have extremist fundamentalist militia and they are terrorizing uh, the um, civilian population and they caused millions of people to flee their homes. In some countries, they're quite desperate, and they're desperately looking for a solution. The EU has helped and is still trying to help with their military forces. Also, there are countries like France that has provided bilateral assistance unsuccessfully, unfortunately, and some forces like the quasi-private militia, Wagner, I'm saying quasi because uh, they are obviously supported by the Kremlin. So they have also offered their services, but we know that this group is one of those forces that make things worse, particularly because of non-discriminatory violence over civilians, and they are notorious in the Central African Republic, in Mali, not to even mention their criminal activities in Ukraine. The EU remains the most important development partner in the Sahel countries. It is also among the biggest donators of humanitarian aid. But of course, the fact is that it is also up to these countries themselves to do something, because obviously they're facing the problem of corruption, um, governance, concentration of wealth in capitals, and neglect of more remote areas. And this is why the Islamist extremist groups are so successful in remote areas in the north of Burkina Faso in Mali. And there are no simple solutions here. Those like the Wagner group who are trying to enforce simple solutions, they have different interests, uh, in particular, the natural resources in those countries are being looted. We see that Europe is not succeeding in some of these countries, Mali or the Central African Republic, the Moscow propaganda is quite successful. And there is one simple reason why EU is not so successful, because there are certain standards in EU member states for cooperation in the military respect, for example. If you want to set up military cooperation with somebody, sell weapons and arms, we require certain standards, human rights, democracy, and so on. The Russian Federation does not ask these nasty questions. At the same time, their products, their military products, are also quite favorable in terms of price. So many regimes are relying on Russia when it comes to security 
and the EU cannot compete compete so well because we cannot give up some fundamental principles. Thank you very much. Another question. Now, you said it yourself, the number of crises and crisis regions is on the increase. The number of crises which requires answers from the EU. Could it happen that at a certain point, the EU will have to prioritize the crises because uh, from the point of view of the Global South, like it was mentioned in Munich, they feel neglected because of all the assistance that Ukraine is getting. And this is causing dissatisfaction in another part of the world. Now, EU has limited resources. Do you think it can happen that the EU will have to prioritize? Well, resources are one of our biggest issues. Humanitarian needs have gone up since 2018, where we prepared the seven-year budget, and it was prepared under the Juncker Commission back in 2018. And the humanitarian needs have tripled since then. The number of people requiring humanitarian aid has tripled. Our budget has not. It is still where it was. Also, the budget was uh, drafted before the pandemic, and you know that it had very serious uh, financial effects. The budget was also drafted before the Ukraine war, which had enormous effects on our economies our society and our food safety. Our resources have not gone up. Before, we talked about the um, civil protection mechanism. In the first few years, this mechanism was activated on average 20 times per year, meaning one to two times per month. During this term of office, during this commission, more than 100 times per year, meaning more than two times per week. But the resources are still the same. Despite all of that, we managed to create miracles so that because of the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, we did not have to redirect a single euro which was supposed to be spent in other parts of the world. We had to do some magic to obtain additional money, but we did not take a single euro from um, Afghanistan, Yemen, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. No, we did not redirect any funding from other crises to Ukraine. Maybe individual member states have done so, but we have no influence on that. To us, countries are the same. Human lives are equal regardless of where the affected population is. Do I have the time for another question? I'll try to be very quick. What is your view? Now, the EU, back uh, in 92, started to play a very important role of uh, providing the global peace. We have then faced the reality. We have seen uh, disintegration of Yugoslavia, NATO attacked on uh, the Federal Republic of uh, uh, Yugoslavia, then Afghanistan, Ukraine. Now, the consequences of the Ukraine war is that EU member states now perceive NATO as the entity guaranteeing the security. We see NATO is being joined by new member states, Finland, Sweden, and the EU seems to be perceived as not the most important uh, guarantor of peace. 
Well, the EU was never intended to be a defense project. The EU was born as a peace project. Human's vision, the core of his vision was to prevent war and not to prepare for the war. If you want to prepare for war, you, then you have to invest into defense. But the EU, right from the start, was something else, to prevent the war. Now, the problem is that the EU, over 73 years of its existence, managed to prevent war among member states. This is not to be neglected. Since the time of Schumann's idea, Schumann wanted to bring together the key sectors, coal, steel, and uh, Schumann said that if we manage to pool these resources, a war between Germany and France will be impossible, and he was not wrong. His concept worked, and for 73 years, we have not seen any war or even a war threat among member states. So it cannot be contested. This project does work, but only on the inside. If we go beyond the borders of the EU, we see that the security situation is not improving and it is rather deteriorating. Maybe the situation has improved for a while after the end of, of the Balkans war, but now the situation is drastically deteriorating. And of course, uh, the person to blame is sitting in the Kremlin. We see that uh, an expansionist, imperialist war is being waged against a neighboring country. This is what is happening. And in this way, the European security is also under threat. And here we come across the problem that you refer to. The EU has never been intended to be a military alliance or even a defense alliance. EU member states, which are also NATO members, took the peace dividend after the end of the Cold War very seriously, maybe too seriously. They thought, well, now we are going to have permanent peace. There is not going to be any war anymore. It is true the U.S. has also reduced its military uh, investments after the end of the Cold War, but they maintain the capability so that they can provide for security for the European continent as well. But the situation was worse with the European countries, and that's changing. People have realized that we are living in a dangerous world, and that in addition to the peace project, the successful peace project, we also need to improve our responsiveness to the military threats coming from outside. You mentioned the decision of Finland and Sweden. Just have a look at it. For 200 years, Sweden was a neutral country. So for 200 years, they felt safe. And that's no longer the case. They don't feel safe anymore. And these are very telling developments. It is a fact, and I repeat that, the Russian invasion had a sobering effect. It has renewed our awareness that we are living in a dangerous world and that the EU member states have to take care of their security and that they have to invest more into their capabilities of responding to the threats from outside. And I'm talking about investment into military capability, and this is happening. At the EU level, as you can see, some historic changes have happened. And since the Russian invasion onwards, for the first time in European history, the European funding is being used to strengthen defense capabilities. This is an important indicator that things are changing on the basis of uh, the dangerous environment that we are living in. Dr. Nachtigall, 
I will pass the floor to you. We have not touched upon the natural disasters, but of course we are running short of time. Yes, there are many topics. We also remember the intervention of the EU uh, on the occasion of floods in Pakistan, then the catastrophic earthquakes in Turkey and the involvement of the EU and yourself. And there is a number of other affected areas. But before we open the floor for discussion and for questions from the audience as well as online, I have just one more question that concerns the process of globalization. We see that the current model of globalization is reshaping. On the one hand, we see the United States carrying out an industrial, uh, infrastructural renovation. There is a race among uh, federal states in obtaining subsidies. On the other hand, we also see huge efforts when it comes to sustainability on the part of China. China is also trying to abandon fossil fuels. The EU has its recovery and resilience plan and also the green transition. In this regard, I have the following question. We had more Europe several times today as a response to several challenges. However, is, it, is there also any space for more initiatives coming from the bottom? Is there any possibilities from initiatives from the local area? We also need a more balanced national and regional development. Don't you think that we should look for more synergies and coordination of efforts? Don't you think we need more bottom-up approaches? We should not forget the local communities, the civil society, young people, young entrepreneurs, the rural areas, the civil society. Don't you think that, in addition, of course, to the lack of funding, that we are also lacking a development space for local communities, for citizens, don't you believe that a bottom-up model would be more authentic and more true to the social economy model of Europe? Of course, it has to be adapted to mm, the current development and advancement in the 21st century, but don't you believe that such a uh, renovation of Europe could also be an incentive or an inspiration for other parts of the world, the sub uh, Saharan Africa, Latin America, a new Bretton Woods model of the 21st century. Of course, we are lacking financial resources, but I think that we are lacking development space for initiatives of excluded parts of the world. We see that we are only pumping humanitarian aid. Of course it's precious, of course it's welcome, but it is not going to help unless we have a dissemination of knowledge and empowerment of the excluded parts of the world so that they can step on their own feet, organize themselves, and get involved in uh, all the technologies of the 21st century. Thank you very much. Let me start with floods in Pakistan. It was horrible. I traveled to the flooded areas, and at a certain point in time, one third of the country was underwater. One third of a two million population country. The entire harvest of cotton and everything else was lost. The dimensions of these floods were atrocious. Nobody remembered anything like that in Pakistan or elsewhere. And time and time again, 
I kept wondering how is it possible that some people still have doubts about the fact that the earth is getting warmer and that that's a consequence of greenhouse gases. How is it possible that some people still have doubts? Also, the forest fires that we had here in Slovenia in the Kras are related to a long drought, the climate conditions, and that all escalated in the forest fires of the kind that Slovenia has never experienced before. It is only right, therefore, that we are increasing our capabilities of responding to such phenomena. Slovenia has bought new planes so that it will be able to respond to such phenomena in a more efficient and quicker way. We are doing the same at the EU level. We have doubled our uh, capabilities for putting out fire from the air. This is part of our strategic reserve, but it is not going to work in the long run. Because if the current trends continue, and I have just told you what the trends are, we'll have to continue doubling our capacities. And it's a never-ending story. And at a certain point, we will run out of our capabilities. So we'll have to focus more on prevention. And the green transition is just that. The famous limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius that has been proven scientifically. This is the limit which should not be exceeded if we want to continue living on this planet. And this is why uh, the green transition is so important. And of course, abandoning uh, fossil fuels is part and parcel of that. And I'm fully aware of all the difficult debates concerning the thermal power plant, Shostan, in Slovenia, for example. However, we'll have to make some changes. Some people will say, well, how much does that contribute to global warming, 0, 0.00? But look, we are also getting the effects of global warming in a similar percentage. We did not face floods like they did in Pakistan, but we did face a forest fire. So we all have to do our homework. And fossil fuels play a key role if we want to stop the trend of ever more serious natural disasters that are related to the climate change. And then there is another element. Most fossil fuels are imported in Europe. And at the beginning of the Russian invasion in Ukraine, we have seen what dependency from other countries means. Why did the price of electricity go up? Because the prices are formed on a common market. And if we are short of electricity, the price will depend on the price of electricity usually produced from gas power plants. So the price of electricity was the result of uh, the jump in the prices of gas. And why did the prices of gas go up? Well, the Russian propaganda will tell you it is because of the EU. But the fact is that the EU has not introduced any sanctions on Russian gas. Even today, there is free import of Russian gas. But of course, Russian gas cannot be imported because Mr. Putin decided to reduce the supply of Russian gas to the EU so that the price of gas and electricity will go up. 
so that European citizens will be angry and will demand that the EU should change its policy towards Russia. This was his plan, but thanks to our joint efforts, it did not work. Also, thanks to the citizens who saved on electricity, gas, and also the EU looked for alternative sources. But this was one of the lessons we learned in terms of how dangerous our dependence on fossil fuels can be. And if we want to be truly secure, and this is how I understand strategic autonomy, some people say it means that we can organize our military on our, uh, on our own. But no, I understand strategic autonomy in terms of not being dependent on unreliable suppliers of resources. You will never have a reliable supply of uh, fossil fuels because we simply don't have enough of them in Europe. So it's not just about climate change, it's also about strategic autonomy and security of the EU. For all these reasons, switching to renewable energy sources is a must. It can also be nuclear energy, that's up to the member states, but definitely we have to give up fossil fuels. And now I would like to refer to your last thought, local community and the role of the citizens. It is our role to keep explaining this story so that people will understand that their cheap electricity and their cheap heating with Russian gas is not so cheap because just overnight it can become very expensive or the supply will stop completely. This is why we have to invest into renewable energy sources. It's not cheap, but in the long run, it's much cheaper than to continue the fossil fuel story. Thank you very much for your answers. And now I would like to open the floor to you, dear audience. You can ask your questions online or directly I would like to invite our students to get involved and to share their views and proposals. This is an excellent opportunity. We are hosting a commissioner, and I'm sure that he will uh, convey your message to the European Commission. So this is an opportunity to hear uh, how the bottom-up approach works in practice. Can you please introduce yourselves? Professor Sochan, can we give the floor to our young students? Well, let's pretend I'm young. Yes, judging by your enthusiasm, you are setting an excellent example. Mr. Lenarcic, you put it very nicely. EU is a peace project. However, things are changing. And there's one thing I would like to know. Some intelligent people dealing with defense have been saying for the last 10, 15 years that codes will be more important than bombs. And I'm afraid that Europe is lagging behind without good reason. The United States have been investing 250 to 300 billion to advanced and future technologies. And they have been doing that for the last four decades. And we are talking military projects, quantum technologies, artificial intelligence, and the like. Artificial intelligence in particular is very important. After the United States comes China. They are also building their military machinery very actively. But what concerns me is that I can see that when it comes to investments into 
demanding future technologies, which can also play a very important role in terms of defense, the EU is investing very little in a very uncoordinated fashion. And I'm talking about the know-how uh, and also products and services. And if I may just add one more thing, if we take a look at Airbus, ITER, ESA agency, we see that in Europe too, something can be done, or the CHIP Act as the most recent development. So there is one thing I would like to know. Do we have the will? Do we have uh, the power to do something about these modern technologies to improve our security. Well, thank you very much. Definitely the awareness about the need to go in the direction is getting stronger. But our objective capabilities are limited. And I'm talking about the budget. Of course, there is also the question of competency, science, research, and so on. But in particular, defense. Defense is the exclusive competence of the member states. The EU is trying to strengthen its role in this regard. And I have already mentioned that European resources are being spent on uh, military production due to the events in our neighborhood. These are major changes, and they show that we are becoming more and more aware that more needs to be done at the EU level as well. And because of the circumstances in our neighborhood, member states now agree that uh, the EU should also play a role without the Russian aggression in Ukraine, I'm 100% sure that member states uh, would not allow a single euro to be spent on uh, defense capabilities. And it's quite similar with technologies, artificial intelligence. There, member states are very jealous of their competences unless we are faced with geopolitical storms like we are today. Then they are more open to uh, an important role played by the EU. And I have already described to you how we increased the EU role in the field of civil protection. We were quite successful. And something similar is happening in the military area. But here, we come across another obstacle that I have already mentioned, and that's the EU budget. As you know, the EU budget is quite rigid. The unwritten rule is that it can be up to 1% of the uh, GDP of the EU as a whole. So you have this uh, unwritten rule of 1% of the GDP that nobody dares to violate, in particular, some countries are insisting. But then, on the other hand, you also have the expectation of the population and the local players who want to see more Europe. But yet, we only have 1% of uh, the GDP. Compare this to the budget of Slovenia or any other country, and you will see how much the EU has in its budget as compared to the member states. It's very, very, very little. So 1% is really not a lot compared to the money that some member states have uh, available. On the other hand, it is quite evident that uh, European citizens want to have more Europe here, more Europe there, simply because we have certain challenges that cannot be faced by any single country. The second problem of the EU budget is 
that um, it is quite set in stone. About one third is being used for cohesion funds, one third for the holy cow, which is called the CAP. These two holy cows are untouchable and you cannot take a single euro. And there are good reasons for that, and I'm not going to talk about that. And then there is about a third for everything else, science, research, defense. So about one third of 1% of the GDP, and it's quite clear you cannot do any magic with that. If you just take defense collectively, EU countries dedicate for defense an amount that is not small. It's even comparable to the United States. But the problem that you mentioned, Professor, is that this money is quite um, fragmented. Each country is developing its tanks, its uh, fighters, and of course, this has consequences, speaking of economies of scale and so on. So the money that uh, we are investing, even though we took the peace dividend very seriously and we all reduced our military investments, even that little money is being um, wasted because we are so uncoordinated. But now we are trying to achieve more Europe in terms of um, research, science, and joint efforts. So I'm an optimist, but of course, we'll have to do something about the budget, because without the necessary funding, we will simply not be able to achieve anything more. Next question, please. My name is Laura, and I am a um, first-year student of international relations. Thank you for your excellent answers. A few days ago, Israel built a school that was built with EU funding. What's your take on that? Do you have any competence there? And um, do you think that the fact that there was no serious response, that that decreases the legitimacy of the EU. Uh, the EU did react. The ambassadors of the EU in Israel responded. I myself also reacted and responded on the social uh, media. It's not the first time it happened. These are recurring phenomena. Even worse, the trend is quite worrying. We see there is more and more confiscation, devastation of the infrastructure built with uh, EU funding. What we can do is we uh, protest and we point out to Israel that this is a violation of international law, that it's a violation of the fundamental rights of Palestinians, children in particular, who have the right to be schooled. Thirdly, it's also a violation of the obligation of the occupational force, which is Israel, and fourthly, we demand a, um, a compensation or restitution of uh, the damage caused by their actions. So this is not acceptable. And it's something that we keep pointing out. And hopefully, a day will come where such actions uh, are no longer taken and the damage is repaid. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for a very interesting dialogue. I am Lauros uh, 
mate. My name is Isaac. I'm also a first year student. Dr. Nachtigal already mentioned the earthquakes in Turkey, but that also affected Syria, where the aid was perhaps uh, not so abundant. Can you describe how it was to work with a country with which the EU has practically no relations? And have you learned any lessons? And has it changed the relationship between the EU and Syria? Well, thank you very much. This allows me to counter the Russian and the Syrian regime propaganda. Let me put it this way. The EU assistance following the earthquakes in Turkey and in, in Syria occurred in two channels, civil protection and humanitarian aid. These are two channels that are in my portfolio. The Turkish authorities asked for assistance an hour and a half after the earthquake. They realized very quickly what uh, the dimensions of the earthquake were and that they would not be up to the situation. So we received their request in the early morning hours on February the 6th. We acted immediately. We mobilized all member states. They responded immediately. And I would like to commend Slovenia. So uh, rescue teams were sent to Turkey immediately. More than 1,700 from more than 20 countries responded. And the first rescue teams were on the scene on the very same day. As for Syria, Syria waited until Wednesday before it requested assistance. It was only on Wednesday that they faxed a request to the neighboring Lebanon to the European Commission Representation Office. And we asked member states to help Syria as well. And I think it was 15 member states that also responded and sent their help. But of course, there was a delay of two days because the Syrian request came two days later. But what matters is that despite the fact that the EU has no relations with the Syrian authorities, and there are good reasons for that, trust me, we broke relations with uh, the Syrian regime. We broke our relations because they used chemical weapons on their own population, and we introduced sanctions. But uh, regardless of that, when they asked for help, we responded through the civil protection mechanism, which is an intergovernmental mechanism. So what it takes to activate that mechanism is a request from a government so that we can activate it. Humanitarian aid works differently. There, you don't have an intergovernmental regime. There, we try to deliver humanitarian aid as directly as possible to the people in need. And there, we are held by our partners, humanitarian organizations. And as far as Syria is concerned, we have been present with humanitarian aid for more than 12 years. The earthquake in Syria is just an additional disaster, in addition to the already uh, existing disaster. Billions of euros have already been spent in form of humanitarian aid over the last 12 years, particularly in the area that suffered from the earthquake. So it's not true at all that we neglected Syria, that we were not present in Syria, that we did not help Syria. Just the opposite. In northwest Syria, where the situation was the worst. Well, there we have been present over 12 years already. So our assistance was immediately 
redirect it. to the areas that suffered the most from the earthquake. In, on the Turkish side of the border, we had to increase our humanitarian aid because in Turkey, we were present helping Syrian refugees. But as for Syria, we have been present in Syria for more than 12 years. So there was no discrimination, just the opposite. We reacted promptly as soon as we received the request of the respective governments. Although with the Syrian authorities, we have no official relations. But when it comes to humanitarian aid, Syria is one of the biggest recipients of the humanitarian aid, which has even increased because of uh, the earthquake. We are running out of time. We have the time for another short question. I think the dean wants to ask a question. It's um, really a technical question, Mr. Commissioner. How are you organized within the European Commission? How many people do you have in your cabinet? How does your mechanism work in practice? Well, thank you for this question. This question allows me to uh, counter those opinions who say that it's a marginal portfolio. In our directorate, there are more than 1,000 people, about half of them in Brussels, and about half in more than 40 countries across the world, wherever we have uh, the most serious humanitarian crisis, we have our people. And they are not part of the external action service. There are our ECHO staff. There are the staff of our directorate involved in humanitarian aid, and they are physically present in more than 40 countries, including Syria. In Syria, we have our people in Damascus, where the EU as such does not have its diplomats because we don't have official relations with Syrian authorities. However, we have important humanitarian operations. We are an important humanitarian donor in Syria, so we have to be with our feet on the ground to see what the needs are. And we also manage the spending of money. This is just an example. But like I said, we have our people in more than 40 countries. And from these 40 countries, they cover more than 80 countries where we finance humanitarian activities. So all in all, we cover 80 countries. Our humanitarian operations budget usually exceeds two billion. And you can add several hundreds of euro for civil protection. There the amount is lower because uh, civil protection is based on contributions from member state capabilities. Humanitarian aid is something else. We have a shared responsibility. The EU has the same responsibility as the member states, so the budget is also higher. So these are some figures that illustrate my portfolio. An important part of the portfolio is the European um, the Emergency Response Coordination Center, ERCC. It's operative 24-7, and it is a European Union hub when it comes to civil protection, but also the humanitarian aid. The Emergency Response Coordination Center is the one that uh, responded to the request from Turkey when people were still asleep early in the morning. So it is the very essence of our portfolio, and the e 
RCC never sleeps. Thank you very much, and thank you for your clarifications. This helps us to understand the European crisis mechanisms much better. I would like to thank all of you in the audience for coming. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank you for your questions and for the interest that you are demonstrating online. In conclusion, I would like to thank the Commissioner, Mr. Lenarcic, for a very informative and interesting dialogue, extremely useful answers, and I'm sure that on behalf of all of us, I can wish him successful work in combating current and future crisis. With his help, the EU, in the spirit of the Schuman Declaration, can help towards a better future across the globe. Thank you very much. We have provided him some snakes, some snacks in front of the hall, and maybe we can also proceed with some uh, informal uh, debate. Thank you very much.